Thanks for joining us. Glad you could be with us. Well, obviously, cr public safety, crime, and punishment are crucial issues in our community, and that's why we always welcome the opportunity to talk with our guest this morning, the District Attorney of Suffolk County, Dan Conley, now marking his 15th year in that office. Congratulations. John, that's an eternity. Here. It seems like it sometimes, but uh, no, I'm, in, in other ways, it flew by. Well, it seems like every time you're here, we're talking about issues related to the courts and sentencing, most recently the push for to do away with mandatory minimum sentences. You have been a staunch opponent of that and continue to oppose it. Why? Well, I, it, it works. You know, we uh, reserve mandatory minimum sentences for drug traffickers, for murderers, for child rapists, and for repeat drunk drivers and people who tote. Uh, unlawful, you know, carrying firearms, which they don't have a license to do. And this is part of the reason why, part of the recipe, part of the formula, I believe, when we target the right individual for, for these types of crimes, you, when I say target, when they commit these crimes and target them for swift and certain incarceration, it drives crime down. And we are one of the safest big cities in America. And uh, that's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason. There's a lot of great things going on in the, in the city in terms of nonprofit and intervention strategies and the like. But for those individuals who are the high-risk offenders who are driving crime and violence, and, and we know who they are, these are very effective tools for prosecutors. Well, a couple of weeks ago, you had some pretty pointed criticism for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, Ralph Gantz, after he joined with lawmakers at a press conference promoting uh, an end to mandatory minimums. You said, quote, he, that Gantz is being more political than any chief justice I've ever seen in my 30 plus years of practice. And I've heard from other judges that it's a bit unseemly, unquote. Why shouldn't he speak his mind like anybody else? Well, we appoint our judges in Massachusetts. In other parts of the country, they're elected. And I'm certainly not advocating for an elected judiciary. In those parts of the country, it's a real criticism that the judges act politically. We appoint our judges for life, essentially, it's 70 you know, before then it's a mandatory retirement, but nevertheless they're appointed for life or uh, until age 70 to be independent and to be non-political. You know, uh, I watched the president uh, give his speech to Congress the other day. There was about half of the members of the Supreme Court there. What did you, what did you not see them do? They didn't applaud. You know, they didn't demonstrate any uh, thumbs up or thumbs down to any of the, the uh, issues that the president spoke about. You never hear of the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court lobbying Congress on any matter before it. My, my view is this. I, I, uh, Ju Chief Justice Gantz and I are friends, and I respect him. He's a very talented jurist. I just think on this issue, he ought to stay in his lane. Uh, and he ought to simply, you know, he, these matters may come before him. And if they do come before him, there's a risk that he may have to recuse himself from these sorts of matters. You know, he's made his point. He does not believe that these should be uh, applicable. But this is a legislative decision, a legislative prerogative that they are saying to simply judges, don't go any lower than this uh, in certain crimes. Well, your comments on this uh, went beyond Gantz. You said, uh, quote, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've got a pretty good handle on who's driving violence. Judges don't have that same handle with all due respect. Judges are more likely to make a significant mistake that could have a big impact on the community, end quote. Well, here's my, again, I have uh, so many of my uh, former uh, colleagues and uh, many of my friends on the other side of the aisle, defense attorneys, are now judges. And I've been in practice since 1983, and I became an assistant district attorney in 1984. You know, today, we in law enforcement have so much intelligence that we have gathered on the individuals who are high risk offenders driving violence in this city. So we're very smart on prosecution. There's only about 800 individuals serving a mandatory minimum drug sentence in all of Massachusetts as we speak. So we're not using this in a way that's onerous or burdensome. We are doing this in a way that we believe is having the most impact on the safety of neighborhoods. When I say I have, I have more knowledge on this, I, I do. It's just, but, but these comments seem to suggest you think the judges in general are too lenient. Well, you know, let me give you an example. So we have uh, in Chapter 269, uh, unlawfully carrying a firearm, carries a mandatory minimum uh, sentence of, of 18 months. If that gun is in your home, there's no mandatory minimum sentence. Uh, same gang member, same record, same, uh, you know, impact player, if you will. 
Uh, and you go to our gun court, last year only one individual who had a gun in his house went to jail. If you're carrying that same gun out in the street, they all went to prison. And so that kind of gives you a glimpse as to what is likely to happen if there was full and unfettered discretion. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we return, we'll continue our conversation about crime and punishment with the DA of Suffolk County, Dan Conley. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking with Suffolk County DA Dan Conley. And Dan, I want to squeeze in a couple more issues here in the limited time we have left. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of attention right now to the double murder trial of Aaron Hernandez, the former Patriot. And I know that because it's ongoing, you really cannot comment on it. But one question people have asked me, and I do want to ask you, is uh, this guy's already serving life for the murder of Odin Lloyd. Why are we even prosecuting this case? We're prosecuting this case for two very important reasons, the memory of Daniel De Abreu and Seferro Furtado and their families. They were victimized in this case, and they should have their opportunity at justice. And that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're prosecuting on behalf of the, their memories and their families. These are discrete crimes, and they ought to be uh, prosecuted, uh, even though the defendant is already incarcerated in another offense. Do you always do that in a case where the... Uh, the accused is already away for a similar crime? Yes, we w absolutely would, because as far as I'm concerned, again, these victims deserve uh, nothing less than our very best efforts. Okay. The first assistant district attorney is on the case. He was on it actually from day one, uh, long before this defendant was indicted. So, um, you know, we've always believed that every life has value, and no matter what uh, uh, choices people make in life, they have value. These are two hardworking immigrants that deserve their opportunity at justice and their families especially do who have been left behind and are grieving. I'm afraid we just have under a minute left, but I did want to ask you real quickly about the Juvenile Alternative Resolution Program. It's a new program that you're involved with with other agencies where basically you intervene early on with a juvenile that looks like they might be headed for trouble and try to forestall that trouble mushrooming into something more serious. When I read about this, it reminded me of a lot of what we were doing during the Boston miracle years of the early 90s. Probation, uh, the courts, all, the cops, all sorts of agencies would identify even a very young kid who their parents had complained they're running with the wrong group and try to nip it in the bud. Did we get away from these things that seemed to work back there and now we're returning to them or has this been ongoing all along? Well. The late Tom Menino used to say to me all the time, Dan, why are these people, uh, these nonprofits, all working sort of uh, without any kind of correlation or connection to each other? So I think there's a lot of good people out there that have been doing a lot of great work, and so that stuff really hasn't stopped. But what we're doing here is we've always diverted juveniles who shoplift, who, you know, who do commit... Um, graffiti or you know some you, you know steal from a neighbor or something like that not to minimize those things right. but we always diverted those we're going after a different cohort now young individuals who are really on a path to become problematic individuals into the adult system and we're taking a chance on what I would call you know moderate to upper level risk uh, juveniles we're going to try to intervene really significantly and meaningfully in their life and I thank UMass and I thank I, I thank the RFK Center and I thank so many of other nonprofits who jumped in to help us ABCD uh, and we're really optimistic that we'll be able to divert enough kids to really make a meaningful impact impact. Come back again here later in the year. We'd like an update on how that's going and we'll look forward to talking with you again. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy that. Thanks, John. Take Appreciate care. it. Thank Dan you. Conley, District Attorney of Suffolk County. That's it for me. Now it's back over to my colleagues for more WBZ News.